this programme, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to see together some dishes which can be very economical indeed. So, basically, it's about pastes for pasta and pastry, because if we think about it, whenever we have to try and be very economical in the kitchen, we're always using more starch and even more sugar than we would do otherwise to stretch more costly items like meat and fish and fruit. And so I'm starting here now in this bowl with the ingredients, the basic ingredients for a, a ravioli paste, because ravioli is very easy to make at home and of course costs a fraction of what it does if you go and buy it in the shops. I've got eight ounces of flour and two ounces of butter. I rub the two together and then all I use apart from that is just cold water. And while I'm mixing it together, Simon's coming in and he's going to put one by one in this bowl and blend the ingredients that we need for the ravioli filling, one of many. First of all, six ounces of cooked minced meat. And that goes in. And then two ounces of cooked sieved brains. Now, if you think those are too extravagant, this is a, this is a classic, of course, the, uh, the Italian recipe that is used by serious Italian cooks. And to vary it, you can add cream cheese instead, cream cheese which is either the ricotta, which is the Italian one, or any other that you like. Now, in on top of that, we add six ounces of cooked sieved spinach. And when you can't obtain fresh spinach, it is permissible for you to use there a canned one and warm that through and sieve it. Then the equivalent altogether to about two flat dessert spoonfuls of finely grated carrots or onions. In this case we're using the carrots and the main thing to remember there is that you give them about three or four minutes cooking with a tiny nut of butter which we've done already. Then an egg, I see you break it with one hand like me, and then the two ounces of parmesan cheese. And there really isn't any substitute for that, except the very stalest mustard. And some of the most important Italian herb, basil, which I'll have more to say about later, and some grated nutmeg, which is also classic, and of course a seasoning of salt and pepper. And then Simon goes on and works those up to a smooth paste for me so that I can use that paste for filling the ravioli. Here is the dough ready. And at this point, may I remind you that this is the one exception that you're ever likely to see from me to the rule that pastes for pastry of all descriptions are made on a cold surface and never in a bowl. In this case, you do rub the butter in in the basin. Now, there's the dough, no longer, not, not yet finished, because you then have to knead it. And you knead it for about three or four minutes, which we shan't be doing, lest you should all drop off asleep. But when you are kneading, you do use the heel of your hand. That's that fat, flat part there by the thumb. And you work it down, you don't pick at it with the tips of your fingers. And I'll go on doing that simply until Simon says to me that he's satisfied that the mixture is well blended and the right consistency for making the ravioli. Now, you know what the ravioli are, don't you? The little squares that you end up with before you cook of pasta, which uh, enclose fillings. This is, I say, the classic one, but you can use much simpler ones, and for the meat that Simon has used, you can use any leftovers. You ready now? Yeah. Good. Well, then I shall leave that for you to finish on the table and hold the icing bag for you to fill. This is an ordinary nylon icing bag, such as you've seen us use many times. And in goes the filling. You needn't give it all to me because I don't use quite all that. You can save that bit. That's right. Put it in the fridge. And then we work it down until we come to the pipe, which is a quarter-inch writing pipe. Let me show you that before we go any further. There's your quarter-inch writing pipe. We leave that paste for Simon to finish, and then he puts it in mild refrigeration for half an hour, or he can leave it there for 24 hours. But you can't work and keep settled for at least half an hour. There was another one waiting for us at another table. And there it is. Now, when you go to work, whether you use the small quantity in the proportions that I've given you, which are those in the booklet, or whether you use more, you divide your paste in the proportions to the eight ounces of flour that you saw me use of about five and a half and about seven and a half ounces. This one is the smaller of the two, the five and a half ounce piece. And you probably saw that I had it covered with a cloth when I came across here. This is because it is a paste which is very bad tempered when it dries out and it starts to crack. And so you have to be very careful when you're using it that you don't let it crack. For this reason, the larger piece, which I've already rolled out, as you don't want me to see it do it twice, is covered with a cloth also, lest when I pick it up on the pin, it too should crack. Now, let me just see. Yes, that's about right for what I want. 
So, now, if I trim the edges off just a little bit, using, of course, at the moment, my handleless rolling pin, which you know is the professional one, you don't put all the weight in the handles and none on the pin, I'll just trim an edge off there and the other so that you can see that it's pretty thin when it's rolled out. Even the trimmings will get used up, so don't worry about wastage. That's stage one. Stage two, well, that depends on what experience you have. Let's assume for the moment you haven't got a great deal, and those of you who have, don't get cross with me and think I'm trying to talk down to you. This is a little pattern for ravioli, which we've made, drawing squares and putting crosses in the middle. The reason will come very clearly to you as we go along. I'm going to use a skewer, and I'm going to make a very clear hole where each of those little crosses are in the centre. This will enable those people who are not very experienced to get their filling put centrally on each of the little squares. A very important thing to do, as you'll see as we go along, if we're going to get an even pattern. Now, there are also lines drawn here. That's to make the thing more comprehensible to you as we're working, but it's not necessary to draw those lines as well. Just the little holes are enough. But because when you're experienced, you don't use the little holes, and because after you've made them, you then brush the paste with raw beaten egg, I'm making them more strongly than I would do normally, so that they will show after I've brushed the surface of the pastry with the egg. So now we can lose it, and you can see all the little holes. The end of the skewer, and on goes the egg. And as long as I can see the holes through, I know that anyone who's never made ravioli before can get their filling perfectly evenly spaced. It's essential to do this very thoroughly, this egg washing, strained egg, of course, because otherwise, when you put the other paste on the top, it won't grip, and you'll be in deadly trouble because your little parcel will open out when they are dropped into the hot liquor in which they're poached. So now for the filling. In the bag, and we just squeeze a little mound like this on the top of each one. I'm not going to chat at you too much while I'm doing this, but there are just one or two odd things I'd like to talk about that are relevant. This is only one of many fillings. You wouldn't expect me to give you one which wasn't a true Italian. But you can substitute whatever savoury filling appeals most to you and use it with perfect success. This pipe is sticking a little bit. I think it wants cleaning, but we'll manage. There we go. That one's a bit mean. That's better. A little stubborn bit there for us. On we go, and we're nearly done. Now, we have to do the whole lot, otherwise you won't see the final part of the process. A crafty finger will save us the pipes behaving badly. That's better, and so on. Now, the next thing we do is we have the larger piece of paste rolled out, larger because when it is rolled up on the pin and unrolled, it's got to accommodate the humps of filling as well. So it would be short at the end if it missed, if it were made the same size as the base one. And here it is protected from drying out with grease book, which I shall just drop, and we pick it up on our handleless rolling pin instead of folding it up in a stupid parcel. Now I'm going to turn myself sideways on to you so that you can see exactly what is happening. And then I unroll this piece of paste over my fillings. That's all right. So, and then brush off the surplus flour with my highly professional sweeper, which is nothing more or less than a distemper brush which hasn't been used on a wall but kept for the kitchen. At this point, of course, well-scrubbed fingers have got to come into the picture because now we make indents with our fingers in between the little humps. And then the pastry grips, the paste grips firmly all the way around, you see? Like that. Now we've got to go this way as well and on the edge, of course. So two crafty fingers worked along and we get it done quite quickly. Now, when you buy ravioli made by professionals and mass-produced, you find that it's got a very elegant, little van, finely van dyked edge. It's not necessary to the quality of the dish when you taste it, or indeed, it's not necessary to the look of it. But if you want to copy it, there's a lovely, simple way that you can do it, which I'd like to show you now. Firstly, the ordinary, straightforward way we do it at home. Take the knife, cut the strips, divide them, and after half an hour again, all more in mild refrigeration, they are ready to poach. Or take a pair of ordinary dressmaker's pinking scissors. A little crafty trick of my own. I use these for all sorts of decorations in the kitchen. And then, you see, cut them with those instead and you've got the professional look that you look out for next time you see ravioli sold in the shops. 
There they are. That one hasn't got trimmed on the other side, so we do that little bit as well. And so we've got the two kinds, and of course it's you to choose, but they must rest. So as you would imagine, I have got another lot waiting under here, which I'll just duck down under the table and collect, and then we take them across and tackle the method of cooking them properly. This, of course, is gorgeously simple. Here I've got an oval copper pan, which is not essential, not even special for this. But I've chosen it because it's the best I can find to enable you to see into the pan a bit and see what is happening. As I throw these ravioli in, not splash that into the fat another time, as I throw them in, so they sink like little stones to the bottom. This is unavoidable and perfectly correct. What happens as you cook them is that gradually they rise to the top. This is the signal that they are almost cooked and only need about half a minute to a minute more, depending on their size and thickness, before they can be lifted out. So I hope that we should be able to stay with them long enough now for you to see that process happening. Now, this is the point where I should draw your attention to one small thing about the difference between homemade pastas and bought ones. When you buy pasta, it has a rather special extra drying out process to enable it to be sold packaged, and so it takes longer to cook. So well, I say to you with these, which I have made myself for you, which are homemade therefore, these only take between three and four minutes. You want to add a bit when you go and buy them. Let's turn that heat up full, give them a stir, and then they will start their bubbling. And one or two precocious ones come up quite soon, but you still give them that extra minute before they're all absolutely done. This container which I've got here is also not classic for ravioli, but it fulfills two purposes. It is shallow, and you can see into it. And it's perfectly adequate for the job. I've put a little oil on the bottom so that the cooked ravioli don't stick when they come out. And in a moment or more, I shall be able to lift some of them. Now, I think you can see already that they're popping up like mad, jostling each other to reach the top surface of the slightly salted fast boiling water or slightly salted stock, which you can use for cooking them in. And after a few moments longer, I shall be able to lift the first few out for you to see. I'm not going to lift them all out because I don't think they'll all be quite done and I'm going to ask Simon to take over from me and carry on lifting the rest out as he's done this many, many times at home. Now, here they come. You see, swollen now, all fat and bulgy, these little packets, and ready to be slid onto the oily container. I'm using a perforated metal spoon for this job. Well, it's a metal slice, really, but it skims beautifully when you want to either skim grease off anything or foam off anything or lift up little fragile jobs like these. That's enough for you to see what's going on. I'll put the thing down here for Simon and I will leave him to finish the job off for me. Well, we tackle something with a very strange name in the kitchen, Bricks. You may rightly think at first that a brick is the very last thing that should have any association with good cookery and in the main you would be correct but there are exceptions. Now I want you to think of this piece of paste on here as little bits of leftover trimmings, nothing more than that. Trimmings of either the three minute puff that we have studied together, which takes six minutes to make if you remember, it has a funny name, or bought, a good bought puff pastry, the trimmings of either, and then you make a very, very thin square of pastry, about seven to eight inch square. The origin of this is Tunisian, but it is not classically Tunisian for the simple reason that the well, you know Johnny and I travel an awful lot, my husband and I, and we do this, and we do it for part of our work, of course, and at the same time, we're always keeping our eyes open for anything new that we can find and learn about wine and food, cooking. And when we were fortunate enough to be in Tunisia, we discovered that they have some wonderful dishes, including this thing, which they call brick. But we were also fortunate in being asked by a very charming Tunisian housewife to go into her kitchen and see how it was made, and it took three and a half hours to make the paste, so quite obviously it's not for us just isn't on for us to spend three and a half hours on something in this country. So I worked away for a bit experimenting, having seen the dish done, and I came up with this modest version, which makes a wonderful base for using up little bits of leftovers, so little bits. And with an egg apiece, it makes a charming dish. My leftovers in this case are little bits of the minced meat mixed with a tiny little bit of stock, which I used, or rather Simon put in for me, into the ravioli filling. And I make a little line down one side, which is the, the wall, the triangle, and then a little wall around there. Then I used some tiny little leftovers of cheese. The whole thing is 
minimal, but it makes a nice flavour. And all the things that I am using can be substituted whatever you've got that's left over, if it's fishy, or meaty, or gamey, or whatever, that makes a good marriage with a hot cooked egg. Then a little bit of chives, bring out the flavour, and of course a seasoning of salt and pepper. Now having made that little hollow in there to receive a whole raw egg, you break it in. But as you do so, if it's got a lot of white, it tends to ooze over the edge and then you have to work rather fast. So I tell you I'm going to break it. I put a little bit more egg wash on there to make it grip when I've done it. And then I work quite fast on putting the egg in, like this. Press those edges down very, very firmly indeed. That's the only thing you have to remember when doing this. Press those first edges down and then bring the eggy second ones over. And again, very severely and firmly, press those down. So, and then you've got your triangular parcel, frail, rather wobbly, and with a raw egg sitting inside. So with some gentleness, I will lift it up and ease it onto that dish. And then let's go over and see how we cook this strange object. very large deep frying pan from home which has slightly smoking hot oil which means that it's dead right for this and of course is at about thermostat 400. And then again with some gentleness I lift my frail parcel and slide it into that smoking hot fat. Gradually ease the slice away and start flicking the hot oil over the top. And as I do so the whole thing blows up until it becomes a very puffed up and prideful triangle indeed. Now, in Tunisia, there are two ways of eating these. In the olden days, when everybody lived in tents, they ate them squatting, they worked from triangle end to triangle end, with the egg white set by the cooking time, and the egg yolk still quite runny. And they um, had bowls, you know, they're always very ceremonial about their bowls of water scented with rose water, or orange flower water, and then they had napkins on which to wipe their fingers. The very poorest clean their fingers in the sand. I'm going to turn this over now. In modern Tunisia, where a lot of Tunisians wear modern dress, some still eat it in the same way from triangle end to end, others have it served on a plate and eat it with a knife and fork. And you can see already how enormously that has swollen up. Now the final part of this is to turn the heat down quite a bit and quite slowly so that the egg is properly cooked to let it go on cooking through and then Simon will bring us that to look at later on. Now, I'm not going to put it on the dish now, dear. I'm going to leave it for you for later on. So I'll just show you that and show you a dish full of them, and that is what you will see with mine attached to it. Can you go on each? No, just hold it on for a moment, dear, will you? Perhaps it's cooked long enough because this oil was very hot. You know, I believe it has, and you can see the whole thing now. There is this beautiful fat. Let's take that one off and put the new one on, and then they can see for themselves nothing has leaked out and the whole thing's absolutely perfect. Well, as to the garnish, which Simon was reminding me I was going to forget for you, I'm sick of dumping bits of parsley on, so I take a bit of florissoir and I make these in advance and I can keep them for up to two or three days in a bowl of water so that very, very quickly I can put something fuzzy and pretty as garnish onto a simple supper dish like this, which costs hardly anything. If you want to, of course, you can make an arch of another one over the top and so on. And so there's a load of bricks. Now, Simon will take those away for me, and then he's going to come back and take over on something. You see, what I'm going to do next is to make, almost right the way through, and then show you a finished one, a sauce which has been, so much rubbish has been talked about. It's been built up as something mystical and strange and complex and expensive and all the things that, in fact, it isn't. And it's the real sauce made with tomatoes and meat and herbs and things which goes with lots of pastas. And here, in this bowl, Simon's, in this pan, Simon's coming in now to show us, he will show you the pasta that I'm using, not the old spaghetti we used last time, because you've seen that, but another one, called a tagliatelle verde, and he will show you that, and then we will marry it with the other presently. I begin with this pan with three fluid ounces of oil in it, and an ounce and a half of butter, because you know, whoever spread this fallacy the Italians only cook in ponds of oil. It's screwy and doesn't know what they're talking about. They use a great deal of butter. Then I'm going to put in, first of, all, first of all, the little bit of finely chopped celery, raw grated carrot, 
and raw grated onion. And then stir those round over a first heat until they begin to get brown. Now this sauce, you can leave out bits of what I've given you in the booklet and I'm telling you here. You can adapt it to suit your purse. I'm giving you a true one, which should not really be called a sauce bolognese at all, although it comes from Bologna, but should be called a ragu, R-A-G-U, with an accent bolognese, when it is made in its entirety. You just lose the grand name and call it a nice old sauce for pasta when you make modifications. Now, those are fried, so we start on the next lot. This is diced bacon or ham. In that goes with raw, this time, minced beef. And then you work those down in the pan next. And then, once you've got the juices pressed out sufficiently to break down the meat and blend it with the vegetables, you level off your heat a little bit and then go on adding other things. But if you had the first heat while you were adding them, you probably burn the bottom of the pan, which didn't do anybody any good. So let's turn it down a bit. So, now the next thing to go in is tomato, soft tomato puree, which has been cooked. The tomatoes are cooked in a small pan with a nut of butter, which you can see I've already done, and then they are rubbed through a sieve with one of these rollers, which I find almost indispensable. And you see, you just rub away, and all the goodness, without a set of scrap of skin or seeds, goes into the mixture just scrape any surface off the bottom. Then we stir that in, and then we still go on adding things for quite a bit. The next thing to go in is diced liver. Now, in the real one, it is chicken's liver. But when I tell you that there are so many tricks you can play and I illustrate one, you'll realize you don't have to have it. The coarsest is the ox liver and the cheapest, of course. If you put ox liver, as I've seen certain, na certain naughty commercial caterers do, into a bowl and cover it with milk and a bit of bicarbonate of soda and leave it for 24 hours, it has all the colour of the real soft calves liver, the pale one, and it loses its coarse flavour. So you see, you can do it in the interests of economy when you want to be more economical than using even a tiny bit of chicken's liver. Then we want some basil in there. This is the herb I want to say more about in a moment. And then we want some liquids. And these liquids are six fluid ounces of wine. Chianti white, Italian, and 12, double the amount, fluid ounces, of stock or water. And I've deliberately for once used the water because with it you can make a very good sauce indeed. Now you stir this, you season it of course with salt and pepper, and I didn't put quite enough of my favourite basil in there, you know, in the 16th century basil was brought to this country. It's one of the great herbs of Italy, rosemary and wild thyme, and oregano, oregano, and when it was brought here, it was used for centuries enormously by the English. It goes marvellously with everything with tomato. It has great character, especially when you pound it and get the rich oil out of it. And then somehow it fell into desuetude, and it's very few people who grow it, although a brilliant cookery colleague of mine wrote so factually for both of us when she said, although she may not have known it, that she grew it in a window box in London and even on a roof garden in London. It's very simple to grow. It's one of the valuable herbs. Of course, as I say, others are rosemary, which you don't use, the spikes, it's used in Italian cooking, and myrtle, which you use in Italian cooking. Now, of all the easy ones, the ones that we can grow simply here, there's just not enough done for them and with them. So, if any of you really do want to know more about it, and I can tell you where to get supplies, for instance, I mean, um, wild thyme, well, you can find it on the South Downs, but you won't go rooting about there digging it up, I hope. So send me a postcard instead, but to me, not the poor BBC, just say to, to Fanny Craddock, BBC, and send in a letter rather because I'd rather have a stamped top desk envelope if you can and I'll send you information on herbs if you want them now at this stage that sauce is simmered very gently under a lid or a covering foil for 30 minutes and we're not going to do that are we so you'll be fascinated I hope to realize that you can in fact use one which you have made beforehand and reheat and if you want to go grand with it not when you're feeling very economical you can add just a few drops of thick cream to it. So that is what we do next, and that sauce is then ready to use. So let us take it across to where I'm sure the pasta that I want to use is waiting for me. Now, there are over 52 varieties of pasta. And when they're called, like this one, Tagliatelle Verdi in one region of Italy, they are called something entirely different in another. So it's merciful that the one that's most generally known, like the word tagliatelle that I've just employed, 
He's the one that's understood, even though they will correct you and use their provincial name. Sorry for the bangings about. There it is, green because it's made with spinach, absolutely delicious, and it's one of the ones that you can make at home for which you do not need a machine. Now, let's get that out of the way. And even though it's dripping a bit, let's put it on this very clean table surface, because I want you to see what happens into the saucepan that we've used. It's clean, but it isn't very dry. So I'll take a cloth and wipe it out fairly thoroughly. You know, when Englishmen came home after the Second World War and who'd seen service in Italy, they said rather disconsolate with their womenfolk when they saw this rather sad, grey stewed knitting, which was rampant then but not now. Please, why can't we have spaghetti like we had in Italy? And so they learnt to make it, not looking like auntie's old sodden comms, you know. And what you do is, you, when you've cooked it properly, not just till it's al dente, firm on the teeth, but not very, not soft and peppy, you turn it into a pan with either butter or oil, or a little bit of both, and then you swirl it around until it's got a lovely rich sheen on it and looks like that. Then you either pour your sauce straight over it, mix it well together and put it on the dish, or as I shall do now so that you get a clearer picture of what's happening, you put it on, there it is, shining and perfect. And then you make a hole in the centre and pour in some of your lovely sauce and have some left over for serving separately. There we go. And that is a dish which, without things like the chicken's livers and the cream, can be modified with top of the milk. You get the same consistency if you just simmer down a little longer, which hurts nobody's purse, but is always popular and is beautifully filling. Mm, and here, sitting waiting for us, are those cooked ravioli. Now you can use a tomato sauce for these, which I've given you in the booklet. We haven't got time to make it, and we wouldn't anyway, because it's repetitious. It's just a modified version of this um, Italian sauce without the meat. Here it is. And you can do such simple things instead as this. Scatter it liberally with grated cheese. Really liberally. And then just flick it with, with, with melted butter. You see, again, the Italians do use lashings of melted butter. In fact, butter. They are really more lavish cooks than the French. And not always so economical. A bit of my beloved basil that I've been talking to you about. And then let's move over here and have a look at those bricks. There they are with their garland of parsley. You remember that you don't have to copy the fillings I made. But in fact, can use anything with an egg and leftovers of pastry. This we've just done. There's nothing more to say except don't overcook your pastas. Have them al dente. And so we move to... Another tagliatelle, this is the one without the spinach in, which is just butter coloured, the ordinary tagliatelle. And then the tagliatelle verde, which is exactly the same as the one that we've cooked. It swells up in the cooking. This one, which is called lasagna verde, the green again being spinach, and that's one that you can put into pie dish in layers when you've poached it for a few minutes and then cover with all sorts of meat, tomato and sauce mixtures, bake it in the oven. And when I make enough for 18 people, about eight, polish it off. Here's one called tufoloni in here, and those tufoloni can be filled with the ravioli mixture and some here called lumaconi, which are shells, and they too can be filled with ravioli mixture. Just to give you a few more ideas. 